Hello, Victor. Uh, it's, it's great to have you on the show. Um, really excited to have you. Welcome. Thank you, Nikita. It's nice uh, to be here. Thank you. Uh, let, let's uh, kick it off uh, for those that uh, haven't heard your story. Uh, what, uh, got, what got you interested in uh, statistics and its uh, financial application? Well, you probably know where Brighton Beach is, where 90% of the Russians live. Well, in the old days, Brighton Beach was a private recreational park. We called it Brighton Beach Baths. And it had, it was the biggest, biggest amusement park. It cost $5 to become a member. And they had about 20,000 members. And they played handball was the game of choice. My father uh, was a great man, very scholarly and also very quantitative. And he wrote a book about handball, one of the only books about, and to do it, he calculated the percentage of, of returns on hooks and uh, serves uh, to the left side and off the wall killers. And he kept tabulations of the, uh, of the outcomes. And I helped him on that and that got me started with uh, quantifying. Then when I, I went to Harvard, I, I took the elementary statistics course of Frederick Mostella, who's one of the great luminaries in statistics. He's, he's very famous for having solved, having uh, solved every one of the problems in Feller's uh, books on probability. And um, after that, I, I took Cochrane's course uh, on sampling. He was very old then, but he was one of the great luminaries of statistics. When I went to the uh, University of Chicago, the random walk was um, in flower, and I wrote, I had written my thesis on the random walk hypothesis at Harvard. So I was pretty much into uh, quantifying by the time I went to Chicago. Uh, very, very interesting. And so uh, as you kind of harnessed your skills uh, during your uh, days at Harvard and then Chicago and then subsequently, uh, at the, uh, you, you were a professor at the uh, University of Berkeley. Um, this was, as you were saying, uh, during the prime time of efficient market hypothesis and random walk yeah. theory. Um, yeah. And if, if you were, as you were kind of reflecting uh, on these ideas back then, uh, and uh, what role uh, did they, or perhaps their polar opposite, play in your uh, career and you becoming a, an active market participant? and eventually well, starting your trading firm? When I, when I was at the University of Chicago, all the random walkers hated me and they would come to all of my uh, presentations to do me in, including a few of the Nobel Prize winners. I'll never forget how um, objective, uh, objectionable um, and arrogant they were. <laughs> There was one famous incident I, in the, the locus of the of the business school in those days was was in Haskell Hall and it, and once I was on the fourth floor I, which was uh, Jim Laurie's office who was my mentor and I heard four of the random walkers including um, one of the Nobel Prize winners and and another one who was actually, he was a, actually a real quant, uh, who was um, the president of the American Finance Association. Anyway, they were, they were examining some output from the 7090 at that time. And one of them said, well, what if we find something? Why, you know, what, what are we going to do if we find that there really is an effect on stock splits? 
and I memorialized that incident in, in my book. And um, they uh, they came to my thesis presentation and tried to do me in in any way they could. But I, I was very very unfriendly with Mr. Fama. I think on the exam he gave, the question was what. Uh, what evidence is there for the, the efficient markets hypothesis? And I, I answered none. Unfortunately, unfortunately, he he didn't grade it, and I was able to uh, pass my comprehensives. But <coughs> he was a very good tennis player, and he he likes to um, he likes to say that uh, he is a good tennis player, but not very good and I beat him about 98% of the time. Uh, and we played tennis together and we read our disagreements on academic subjects uh, uh, rest while we played. He, he was a lefty. Uh, and um, he was, in those days, everything was the Pareto distribution. You couldn't write a paper unless you showed that uh, the infinite tails of the Pareto distribution was such that uh, it didn't uh, invalidate the infinite variance that um, any empirical work supposedly found. And so on the back of um your time uh, in Chicago and then uh, at Berkeley, where you were a professor, uh, you started your own uh, first uh, trading uh, firm uh, in 1980s. And uh, famously, you uh, made in your first six months uh, from $50,000, uh, 20 million. Uh, can you spare a few words on uh, what was, what uh, made you uh, start to, uh, to trade professionally? Uh, and uh, how did you manage to uh, amass such a great fortune so fast? Oh, well, it was through ignorance. I, I didn't realize that if you pyramided, um, you would eventually lose everything. And as, as gold, I, I believed in the staying power of gold and it's, um, maintenance of its value over many years. And in those days, there were a lot of the uh, free market people believe that you should put, put all your money in the same way they say you should put it in uh, crypto. Now they, they were saying, put it in gold and silver. And I pyramided my, as soon as it, when it went up, I would just double up and Thinking about it, I was so so foolish, so ignorant. And anyway, it got up to twenty million. But as I told you, I I followed the wisdom of of Odysseus and uh, the Odyssey. And I had a I had a stop. I figured if I lost more than half of what I had made, I'd, I'd get out. And my wife sold me out. I'll never forgive her for what she did. I was so angry when she did it, but fortunately that saved me. Although uh, by the time I got out of my, um, my position, it was in, in the middle of a racquetball game with Ruben Gonzalez in Staten Island. I had lost another 50% of my 10 million. I was down to 5 million. It took me that, that much time, uh, that much slippage. By the way, slippage has always been very unfortunate and very uh, costly to me. In fact, I know a lot of you people, uh, you, your viewers believe in uh, the black swan 
um, hypothesis um, popularized by um, certain derivatives expert who happens to be uh, very good at um, at pumping ions. And one of the problems with um, selling volatility that most people don't realize is that the slippage on getting out of a position is often 100%. So on occasions when I, when I had sold volatility and I tried to get out of my position, it turns out there were only several, three, three or four market makers who took the opposite side of the selling volatility side. And they would get together. One of them said he would beat the others up if they, if they made a just decent market that this sounds like an alibi, but, <laughs> but it's true. So you're sort of locked in when you're selling volatility. The only, the only way it can work for you is if um, you carry things to expiration so that you don't have to um, pay the bid on the uh, options that you've sold. But if you try to get out of the options when uh, during the market frame, even in normal times, you know, they'll make a market of something like um, a half to a dollar. And then if you start getting out of your positions, it becomes, you know, and I, I would be buying, the market would raise to 60 cents at a dollar 20 as soon as they knew that you were getting out. And if you try to get out during the volatile conditions, like when the market is going down a lot, then the spread becomes 200%. So if you had 50 million of options that you sold, as I often did, it would cost me about 75 million to get out of the position. And that's the real problem of selling volatility, aside from the fact that, uh, as um, Mr. Sander once introduced me at a, uh, at a meeting in honor of Myron Scholes, and he said, you know, I've been in the, this business for 25 years and almost everybody in the option business has noted that the implied volatility on, on options way out of the money is 40, 50%, whereas the normal volatility, the normal standard deviation relative to the price is about 20%. So that seemed like a good, a good trade. You can sell, sell options supposedly where you'd make money unless, unless the volatility, what the, the standard deviation were to double, say in a month or three months. So people would gravitate into that. He said, everybody I know who has found that strategy is bankrupt now. And uh, those words were all too prescient. Yeah, that, that, that's uh, a, a valuable piece of advice, especially uh, for those that stayed in the market for long enough. Uh, because especially, it's... especially now, in, in, those, in those days, um, they were able to um, eat my lunch when volatility went up from 12% to 28%, and I had to get out of all my positions uh, with a um, hundred percent bid ask spread, but volatility just went up to 60 and 70%. So it, it, for anyone who was selling, selling puts or uh, was selling volatility during that, they would, there was no, there was no, nothing, nothing they could do. They would, they would have been bang. Fortunately, I wasn't, 
I had learned my lesson and I wasn't selling options anymore. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can, you can make money 95% uh, of the time and then once every 10 years you, you lose everything. So it's not as, and, and if you try to, try to time it, you're, you're faced with um, the three traders who, in those days, it was only three, three option makers. Um, now, now I guess you can trade trade on the computer, the market's a little wider, but you have to um, face the fact that they'll beat you up. If, uh, they'll beat the other traders out if they make you a, a reasonable market. Yeah. And, and sort of uh, kind of uh, coming back uh, to, to your trading. Um, so on the back of that uh, spectacular run uh, where you made this uh, 20 million uh, you got uh, your, you, you got recruited by George Soros, uh, and uh, and so you started trading fixed income uh, and effects for him. Uh, how did this uh, transition affect your trading, and what was your biggest lesson during the time at Quantum? Well, I became uh, there was an author named Robert, a New York Times writer named Robert Metz. And we had, uh, I had developed a method of forecasting the market and making daily, daily predictions as to uh, what the uh, S&P would do. And it was an audited record by Laventhor and Horowitz and anyone. Uh, and my wife uh, at that time, Gail Niederhofer, was very... She's very um, forward and she saw Robert Metz um, passing on the street and she said, you know, you should write, write an article about my husband's forecasting method. And he did and we had an audit record of about 72% correct in directions. I subsequently realized that prediction of direction is not, um, not the sign of qua non because uh, first of all, you didn't, it didn't take account of the, uh, the spread between the close and the open. It didn't take account of um, the magnitudes and um, a lot of things wrong, but it, it had a 75% accuracy. Anyway, George Soros uh, read the article and there was a man named Graham Loving who was, uh, uh, Goldbug, who, who skied with George, and he told George, you know, that he should contact me. And one, so one day, George Soros came to my office, and he, uh, and we hit it off. We had like a uh, older brother, younger brother um, relation for about ten or twelve years until he. Um, completely suspended uh, all contact with me. In fact, we once met at a tennis tournament and he wouldn't even shake my hand. But, uh, our uh, friendship was very close. I used, uh, every summer I'd spend a week or two at his house with all my, my kids and I did all his trades in fixed income and stock market at that time. Even in those days, he was very bearish about the stock market. And um, he, um, one day he said, Victor, he said, I want to take a bear raid on the stock market. It was a Friday. I said, that, that's, that's wrong because there's always a, a big drift in the stock market. I, I had participated in the forerunner of the Dimson Martian uh, Staunton uh, studies that showed that the drift of the stock market is something like 50,000 fold a century. In my, in my day, the University of Chicago had um, recorded the price of every stock, it's now part of the uh, CompuStat files and they, they also found that there was a 10% a, a year 
drifted the market. So I, I, I've never um, been um, someone who likes shorting the stock market. I think it's very wrong and I don't think there's any. And uh, George Soros himself said to me, he's lost more money in, by shorting stocks than anything else. And um, how uh, someone with a bearish mind could uh, manage to um, make money is another story. But I, I've, I've watched it and since then I've never seen a short seller who's, who's ended up profitable. So sort of like Mr. Sanders said that everybody who's sold volatility has gone bankrupt. I've, I've never seen anyone who's selling, who's selling short as a vocation or as a modus operandi who hasn't eventually thrown in the towel. And usually um, there'll be a time when the market's going up like it was going down a few months ago. And the last short will close his fund. But fortunately, I've never, never been short the market. I've been able to lose money almost every other way, but not by being short stock market. And so you had a, a very successful run uh, together with Soros. Uh, what made you uh, part ways and start your own firm? No, I, I had my own firm at that time, but uh, he liked he liked to trade pari passu, as he called it, with me, and eventually uh, it drove me insane because when I'd make a trade, he'd like to trade on a pari passu or equivalent basis. So I I would be trading two hundred or three hundred contracts. For myself, and he'd like to put on two thousand for his own personal account and the funds account. So it created a, a very unfortunate tick in my trading because whenever I had a profit, I knew that as soon as I were to turn around, I'd have not only to. Uh, take the opposite side of my position, but George Soros would be trading 10,000 contracts to also parry passu with me. So I, I used to say that the Fed should pay me um, money because I, I equilibrated the market. As soon as I had a half a point profit, I would, or you know, something very small, I'd, start thinking about how I was going to liquidate it. So I became very short term oriented. In those days you can make money by uh, by buying down opens and selling up opens. And whenever the market opened in my favor, I'd be, be buying my measly 200 contracts for my firm and, and 10,000 for him. So I, I became like a, a madman. I never, I never could take a profit. So eventually I said, George, I said, you know, if, suppose you had a, uh, uh, a position and every time you traded 200 contracts for yourself, someone wanted to trade 10,000 contracts ahead of you, the slippage would be such that you would, you couldn't possibly make money. And um, I, I got to that stage and I said to him, um, look, I'd like to stop the trading for you. Um, but that's only part of the story. Uh, he was kind enough to say that I was the only person that ever traded for him. And I think everybody in the financial field has eventually traded for him. I was the only kind, only person who quit while he was ahead. I had, I fortunately was lucky enough to make, to make a few million in profits. But that's not why uh, we severed our relation. Um, 
uh, for um, 10 or 12 years, I, I was like uh, his best friend once. Once I asked him who his best friend was, and he started laughing because he looked at me, and I mean, we weren't really good friends, but I was like his best friend. We'd play tennis two or three times a week. And he'd call me up five or six times a day on a big red phone and ask me what my trades were, and then he'd front run me. And, uh, and, uh, but we basically have diametrically views, uh, diametrically views on the sense of life. The only thing that we had in common was uh, tennis and, um, he has five kids, but I, I, I beat him on that respect. I have seven, seven kids, but he, you know, he believes uh, that the uh, purpose of life is to um, do good for others, and um, I'm, I'm more of an individualist and. Uh, He's backed every Democratic president from time immemorial, and I'm a libertarian. Uh, Gary Johnson was a good friend of mine, and he, when he come to New York, I admire him very much. He used to sleep sleep in my apartment. He was very friendly. We played a game of chess, and George and I played a game, played chess a lot together. I'm a very poor chess player, and George would always beat me in chess, but I was able to give him a, ga a game anyway. So between chess and tennis, and uh, the fact that we um, sometimes I guide him out of shorting stocks, um, and we're always together. Um, we had a very good relation, and then, then one day. Uh, he found um, that it was um, antithetical that, I, that I, I wasn't the kind of person that um, could do good for him. And he, he has one of those attitudes like, you know, what can you do for me tomorrow? So if you can do something for me tomorrow, fine, but if not, goodbye. So it was good, goodbye. His, it was his volition not to have anything to do with me again. Also, I, I believe, and I'm not sure of that, this was the time that the long-term capital was uh, doing the same kind of shorting of puts that I had, and they came to him to ask him if he would buy there, if he would take over their positions. And the rumor is, and I'm not, sure of this, that he immediately took the opposite side of their trades and he moved the, their options, which they had sold short from like five to 10 in 10 minutes. And I had the same option. So one, one time I was, after we had played tennis, I was leaving his house and he walked, walked over from uh, his, his compound to the meadow where I was looking and he said to me, he said, Victor, he said, you're going to lose all your money. Uh, I said, how the could you know I'm gonna lose all my money? He says, but when you lose it, he says, it's not, gonna, it's not good for you, uh, you to take all the slippage. He says, give the positions to me. He says, you won't get any profits or, or credit from it, but I'll take over the positions and I, I won't have any margin calls. And I, he had a fund that was even in those days worth a few billion dollars. My fund was worth quite a bit less. So I don't know, he was possibly embarrassed about taking the opposite side of my positions and doing me in. And I was, I was upset that 
he would take over my positions and um, so so not um, not I have a extraordinary loss exacerbated by him and that was the that was the end of our relation the next next year I was scheduled with my those times I had five kids I was scheduled to come up to his Southampton uh, area as, as I did every year and they called me the day before I was up to get there and they said uh, your visit is cancelled and that was the last I ever saw of him except once we're in a, a doubles tournament where the the sum of the ages of the position of the players had to be under 100 years and I, I was in there with my roommate we were both about 50 and George was playing with a 20 year old very good pro he was about 70 at that time and he saw me and I went to shake his hand because we, we were in really intimate contact um, like a father and son for every 10 minutes for 10, 12 years. And he remazed and wouldn't shake my hand. And since then, we've had no contact whatsoever. Wow. So that, that's, that's the uh, reason that uh, we don't have any more contact. His choice. That was a quite quite a dramatic story. Um, a true one, a true story. Although from his standpoint, there might be some other aspects. I yeah, like these things are always uh, polarized, and uh, people have different opinions and pick mm -hmm. up and, and selectively choose to remember some facts that the other person can perceive differently. But kind of uh, coming back to the trading, so. Um, after you left uh, Soros, you continued to uh, to perform extremely well with your fund, uh, and you had a span of 20 years where you were compounding at 30% uh, per year, uh, and you were consistently ranked as one of the world's best traders. Uh, but 1997 uh, changed all of that. Um, what what yes, happened? Sir. Well, twice twice I won the um, Managed Futures Award as the Outstanding trader and uh, Bloomberg magazine wrote a story about my incredible success and in compounding at 34%. And, and someone wrote in that uh, he's going to um, be uh, uh, going to lose everything um, in the next month. And I, and sure enough, um, in June of 1997, I, um, I, I couldn't get out of my positions except that that was 100 to 200 percent spreads, and I, I got out of them. I was able to, was fortunately able to do so with a, a little. Had a little wherewithal left, and I felt that there was um, some improprieties that the other side was guilty of, and I brought an action against the other side, and uh, I gave all the proceeds. I received some, um, received a few million dollars, and restitution from the many tens of millions that I lost and I gave all all the proceeds to my customers I, and as I said to um, I said it's not much but they said well it's better than a kick in the ass so uh, that was the end of my selling volatility you know, to a large extent
Yeah, we, we, we partially covered it uh, be, beforehand uh, that uh, volatility um, or selling volatility can be quite, quite dangerous when uh, the black swan comes around. And um, so you, you, this was obviously like a very heavy hit when uh, one month you are widely considered as one of the most successful traders with like a remarkable uh, track record, but then uh, suddenly because of the the market structure uh, and some... Um, well, what I was doing was wrong. And I, I received a, a just uh, punishment for uh, the wrongness of what I was doing. However, you know, I've, um, one of the things that I'm proud of is that I developed the first programs for the, uh, <clears throat> for predicting the multivariate time series interrelations between all markets varying by day and time of the day. I wrote this program with my wife Susan in about 1979 and since that time a good percentage of the industry is using my programs. Either they worked for me and they took my methods that they wrote their own programs on Morningstar has a, a program that's like it, although it's not one-tenth as good as what, what I use anyway. I came up with um, the first uh, multivariate time series uh, predictions of, uh, of what the market was going to do next hour and next day based upon, I'd look at the yen and I'd, and I'd say, what the effect of the yen at 9.30 on a Thursday? And a uh, million questions of that nature. But a lot of people who um, are using my program and they, um, <clears throat> this one firm, Crable, who um, that's very big and about, 10 of my former employees uh, work for him and they're all very smart and they have 50 times as much money as, as I do. So it's very, not only do I have to um, fine tune the, the time series aspects of the intermarket trades, but I, I have to beat all, all my former employees who, and my followers um, who employ the same programs. In fact, often they send, they send me a prediction of what the market is going to do, and it's my own program that they're sending me a pr prediction from, which rankles. Do you, do you understand that? In other words, someone will say, well, you know, based upon uh, the stock market, um, being down while bonds are up, uh, the prediction, the uh, the prediction for the open to close is is two point five. S and P points up, and it has a T of minus two uh, of, of two point four six. It'd be my program that that they're getting this from. I, I have the same results right in front of them. That, 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 that's fascinating, um, that um, you, you it's basically... Loathsome. It's loathsome, it's not, it's, it's terrible <laughs> to be uh, a horse yeah. by your own petard. But at the same time, like, uh, as you say, you're proud and uh, this uh, impact that you had on the evolution of the industry is, is quite profound. Um, I've made every mistake in the book and um, as I say, I'm still here. I still, um, still have uh, two tennis courts and a racquetball court and a squash court in my, my compound. And uh, except for the fact that I had a stroke, I'd be um, very mobile and using all my racket, racket. Have a lot of books. By the way, I'd like to tell you readers that 
there's um, Marty Schubert, very, um, a very famous professor of game theory at Yale, who, um, whose um, father-in-law was a member of the stock exchange, uh, took, um, took quite an interest in the stock market. And he said the most important book on the stock market was Horse Trading by Ben Green. And I would say the most important book about the stock market is The Secrets of Professional Turf Handicapping by Robert Bacon. So uh, I would recommend that. And Robert Bacon came up with the principle of ever-changing cycles, which is something that everybody should take account of. It's, it's part of the regression if you take the predicted market move based upon something that's happening. What the regressions don't take account of is that there are agents who change the way the normal outcomes are going to be based upon the previous actions. And Robert Bacon wrote about that and talking about how during a, a handicap season, there are about five different uh, methods that you have to make money. If you start by betting the favorites, then you bet the that then that stops working as other people know about it and the odds become worse. Then you try to uh, bet on long shots and other people have lost all their money. So they're betting on long shots that doesn't work. Then you bet on losses that are freshest, but then by the time you bet on them, that, that came from Florida to New York and you, you bet on those, but by the time you bet on them, they're tired. Anyway, the same thing happens in the market. As soon as the system is working, other people understand and take account of what the forecasts are likely to, and outcomes are likely to be, and they change the actual regressions. It's part of control theory that uh, you'd have to. Um, come up to come up with a proper feedback method to use any normal predictions based on regressions or um, um, yeah it's like second order effects definitely and um, I, I guess this is uh, slippage is, is a good example of uh, how this can backfire uh, using the uh, analogy of what you already said what, what was that again? Uh, slippage. Uh, so when, when you execute. Uh, and you... It's slippage, it's, it's just that the, uh, the relations change. You're, you're using something that's out of date and that uh, uh, there, it's been front run so that you have to always take into account um, the changes in your system. If you take, took the best systems in any year and you applied them in the next year, you would find they lost money. So uh, that's because other people know about what is working and they, they front run it and they change the likely outcomes based upon the principle of ever changing cycles. It's in Robert Bacon's book, one of my great contributions. In fact, um, the book is, has become so popular because of me that it can't be bought. The only time you can, I think the price is something like $300 and you can only get it in a library, in an old fashioned library. And, and uh, just coming back to like uh, innovation uh, and quantitative trading, uh, so you were uh, like a true pioneer in it uh, and you started to implement quantitative methodologies 
uh, in the early days uh, of, of quant hedge funds. Uh, so the Princeton Newport partners, uh, commodities corporations, they were just uh, gaining the momentum and the likes of D. Shaw or in Renaissance, they haven't even been around. Uh, reflect. When I started out, my brokers told me, you know, the way you trade is exactly like Renaissance. Uh, you know, they, they use the same interactions between markets and they use the same quanti quantifying time series. But um, Renaissance is, um, is sure um, outdistanced me, but I don't believe that they could possibly uh, make money by using the kind of regularities that that we used to make. Uh, it, used, it used to be much easier to make money. I believe that a lot of their profits uh, comes uh, from high frequency trading. I could be wrong on that, but um, I don't. I don't believe that they could consistently make money with the kind of volume that that they have to uh, shoulder their slip as you say their slippage and if they paid normal commissions and their commissions they they have to have an edge in terms of uh, their ability to get proper executions and their um, <clears throat> their relations uh, with the higher um, feeders in the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, and so if you were to kind of reflect uh, from the, those early days uh, and think about the quantitative signal generation, order execution uh, and risk management, how did uh, the importance of those factors evolve throughout, throughout the years, according to you? Well, in addition to coming up with the proper uh, market and time to trade, a person has to take account of the proper size of his position because the market likes to take extreme moves to do you in and to take all your money away. And no matter how small you are relative to the market, if uh, there's an opportunity for them to make 10 or, 12, 10 or 20 million by running you in, it will happen. And um, sort of an invisible evil hand. As far as uh, slippage goes, I'm a great believer that the worst lessons that people can ma make is to follow Jesse Livermore's uh, book about boy wonder and uh, to follow his methods because his slippage and commissions was something like 25% of trade and he'd, and he'd um, trade at 10 times margin. So naturally um, he, he went bankrupt five times, but the brokers used to used to give him a stake after he went bankrupt because his commissions were so great that they they'd make money from it. Um, he eventually committed suicide at the Shuri Netherlands Hotel, which is on Sixty uh, Second Street in uh, Central Central Park uh, East. And uh, I, I never walk uh, on that same block. I always cross the streets. So I don't pass the Sherry Netherlands because his lessons are so infamous and so wrong. And so many traders have followed all of his um, ideas and none of them are tested. And all of them lead to tremendous slippage and bankruptcy because of great commissions. I, I think it's very important. Um, in Las Vegas, they say that if, 
in sports betting that if you're accurate 52 percent of the time you can you can make money with uh, a five and a half percent uh, vig against you and most people don't realize that if they're trying to take a two-point profit out of the stock market uh, and say in an individual stock and they they pay zero commissions but the slippage is something like a quarter of a point they're giving they're giving up about six percent slippage on each trade and there's no way you can make money giving up six percent um, to the house on every trade so vig is what i call vig is very important so i've i've learned to keep my vig very very down and never never should a trader go for a small profit because they have they have to <clears throat> fend off people like um, the high frequency traders who who get their orders in before yours and uh, they they have more more capital and they they have infinite infinite ways to uh, do you in so um, the only way to make a living in the market is by taking positions that subsume the overnight because high frequency traders are, are so um so successful that they don't like to take risk overnight they like to close their positions out at the end of the day so if you don't have to take close your positions out at the end of the day, if you can carry them to the next day, then at least you have a fighting chance and you're not dealing with enormous vig that's impossible to uh, arrogate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's important to choose the game uh, where you have a, a good chance of winning and uh, uh, at most, uh, at, at the very least, uh, positive expected value. Uh, of of playing the game and rolling the dice, right? Uh, you, have to, you have to worry about gambler's room, but mainly vig. You, I mean, there's a lot of vig in the market. Sometimes it's hidden, but sometimes it's very obvious that if you're going for a small profit, the the vig is something like five or ten percent by the time you take. Uh, the bid ask spread and the brokerage commissions and the fact that yeah other other uh, the other side will get better executions than you how can you make money if you trade frequently and somebody's taking five percent vig from you every time i think i once did a calculation that if you make a thousand trades and someone takes and you break even on all your trades, but they take 5% from you on each trade. The chances that you'll end up winning are something like one in 200,000. The rate is very important. Yeah. Uh, the odds are not, not so attractive. People just don't realize. And so you kind of- uh, There's a lot of rake in Bitcoin, is it not? Is it not? Well, I, that really depends, actually. Uh, if, you, if you are smart about it uh, and uh, there is like a huge difference uh, how it works for retail investors, like if you are trading like little volumes and you pay huge commissions, I mean, relatively, relatively big, so it could be 1% round trip. Uh, but if you, uh, if you are an institutional guy, uh, but again, depends on the size, you could be running anything between like couple of beeps uh, per, um, per, per leg uh, to maybe like, again, depends on how large of a trade you want to execute, but up to like 30 beeps, you can be comfortable with, with execution, which is still uh, not that little if you're shooting no, for. But, uh, but uh, there are different market makers there. And uh, 
that you computerized and yeah. take account of the differences in their, in their prices, maybe you can reduce that slippage to um, a reasonable uh, level where you can possibly have a chance of making a profit. Unless, unless you're taking a long-term position. Yeah. That's, why, that's why I don't like market neutral um, positions because um, they can, um, they have small profits. The, the profits are uh, funneled into, um, and the, um, <clears throat> You know, one of the constants is that the VIG is very great, but I'm sure you know much more about that than I do. Well, I wouldn't assume that, uh, but uh, kind of coming back to the uh, this example of Jesse Livermore uh, and his uh, perhaps notorious story and, and trading. Uh, if you were, by the way, his um, his wife is famous for having five husbands who completed who committed suicide and one of the things that i i find most loathsome about the boy wonder by the way my grandfather used to trade with him um, and um, is that he had a yacht and while he was going bankrupt once or twice he was on his yacht um, he had a pensions for uh, showgirls. He married the last woman he was married to was a very famous showgirl who had five husbands that uh, committed suicide. I think anyone um, who was married to Jesse Livermore would have a tendency to commit suicide like he did. Wow, that, that, that's quite tragic. Uh, but uh, I guess uh, switching more to, to positive, um, kind of if you were to, um, you, you had a, a great a privilege of working with some of the most remarkable uh, traders uh, and uh, hedge fund managers, and you were friendly with many of them. If you were to choose just one individual that you admired the most uh, for his skill and talent uh, within, in the market, who, who would that be? A man named Paul DeRosa, who was the chief bond trader at Citibank. And he, um, he then started his, his own fund. And he's the best trader by far that I've, that I've seen. And, um, one of the things that first um, attracted to me, in those days, the money supply used to have a big effect on the market. So he developed a system where he would compute all the seasonal adjustments of the money supply and get all the demand deposits of the other banks. And then they would have a, uh, a good forecast of what the money supply should be. Anyway, he used a lot of quantitative methods and, and um, had a lot of sense. Um, I've never met any other traders that I, um, George Soros um, to me was, um, since he was always, always bearish, um, he wasn't um, someone who was trading style I am. I admired and um, Stan Drunkenmiller, um, who was his right hand man, um, followed the most naive technical sy uh, systems that I've ever seen. They were um, handed to him by a, uh, by a technical analyst at the Pittsburgh National Bank. There are kind of things that follow moving averages and, and breakouts. I, I don't see how he made money. I, I see that um, he's been he's been bearish on the stock market during his forty percent rise. 
And um, <clears throat> I would I'd think that in the future, the, the, his expected returns and Soros's expected returns would be um, quite below average, as would Buffett's. I don't consider them. Uh, Oh, there was one, there's one very good trader, Irving Riddell, who was a mentor of mine, who was a chairman of the COMEX. And he had an ability, he, he was one of those traders who made money every day. And when you asked him how he did, he would say fair. But he was a master of spread trading. And all the computer algorithms would come up with methods of, um, Trading spreads, and he knew he knew all the computer algorithms, and he was able, off the top of his head, to um, to hoist them by their own petard, to come up with methods that would do them. And so, yes, he and Irving Riddell and Paul DeRosa are the two greatest traders that I that I know. I've come into contact with. Fascinating, fascinating. And um, I have uh, two more questions for you. Uh, so I have one uh, on uh, on your uh, days at, at Chicago. You've been uh, outspoken, and um, throughout your trading career, you were a contrarian most of the time to what was uh, oh. common common sense and consensus. What is one thing about the market? Uh, that is a common sense, that is uh, a consensus uh, that you most disagree with? I most disagree with trend following, that you can make money. But now, Dims and Marsh and Stanton have, have shown that trend following for individual stocks works. But in terms of those who use naive methods of following when a stock uh, is in a bear market, they think it's bad. When it's in a bull market, they think it's good. Um, trend following doesn't work. It's like the, um, <clears throat> it's like the other side of selling volatility that, that uh, <clears throat> it ends ends up you lose on most of your trades and then and then the profits that you make when you happen to catch a a good trend or such that um, other people have um, the ever changing cycles come in and what looks like it worked in the past doesn't work in the future so like John Henry was a trend follower and um, he lost something about 80% or so in his first fund. And then, and then he um, was given a, a second chance. Um, he, he was able to start another fund and the quid pro quo that he gave his investors was he wasn't going to charge a a commission in his uh, second trend following fund, but that one that one broke also. But he certainly um, managed to make money for himself. He's owner of uh, the Boston Red Sox and a few few other sports teams. And seems to be an admirable person, although. Uh, his uh, acolytes who follow um, trend following, I don't. I think are losers in the market. I don't. I don't believe in technical analysis. I don't believe in uh, moving averages. I don't believe in stochast stochastics. I believe everything should be tested. Whenever somebody comes up with uh, a method of making markets of making money, you should ask the question, or have you tested that? 99% of the time they haven't tested it. And if they've tested it, they haven't taken account of uh, ever-changing cycles. 
So uh, that would be the um, the main thing. Don't don't go for short term profits. Keep your vig small. Don't follow what other people are doing in terms of trend following, and keep your shorting of the stock market to zero. It's not, it's not unusual for the economy to be doing terrible and the stock market to be going up 30, 40% as it is right now. Yes, yes. A quite, quite recent example for, for the last piece of advice currently unfolding even. Um, well, the market uh, seems to love it when um, Trump's uh, chances of winning go down. He, he's now about four and 10 to be elected. And so you might think, well, that's bearish, you know, because um, there'll be larger taxes and business will be more highly regulated when, uh, when Biden wins. However, th that's very bullish as the more he loses, you know, the more the only chance that he has of, of winning is to keep the economy going and to keep the stock market up. And Larry Kudlow, who's a very smart uh, advisor to him, knows that he'll never allow uh, something uh, bearish about the stock market to come down and when it's in a vulnerable thing. So the more Trump's chances go down, the more bullish it is for the stock market. That, that's an interesting paradox, isn't it? Yes, very, uh, it's very strange, but the market is uh, made up of paradoxes like that. Things, things are never what they seem. And deception is very important in the stock market. Everybody should read a book on deception. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, a lot of uh, behavioral biases are out there. Lots of inefficiencies take long time to, to unfold. Uh, and everything just takes so much more more time than it it should almost. I don't believe in the inefficiencies of behavioral finance. I believe those are all uh, bogus. Uh, Fair they're, enough. They're uh, they're based upon students' answers to questions, and the questions are designed to. Uh, Lately, to what they call promiscuous hy hypothesis. That's what Zellner calls behavioral finance, and I, I agree. But you can test biases in the market by looking at what the stock prices do and looking at the way markets act. And then you can find real behavioral psychological biases by following markets. And not by doing constructive experiments with students. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Maybe maybe that that has a better predictive power, uh, and that is testable, as as, as you it's say. Testable, yes, it's testable. Not 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 uh, based upon questionnaires that students fill out at five dollars an hour. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And uh, I I would like to wrap it up uh, by asking you. Um, to, to reflect perhaps on your uh, long-standing career as a market participant uh, and riding the, the highs and lows. Um, what are the three pieces of advice you would give to your younger self? Be humble at all times. Follow the drift, the long-term 50,000-fold a century drift of the stock market. Keep your vig down and count. Everything has to be tested and everything has to be quantified. 
everybody should have a good statistics book and they should um, count everything and test everything. Those are, that's my advice. And did I say keep the VIG down? Yes. <laughs> yeah, the, the, that's, an important, that, the, that's the most important one, right? You want to play the game where you have the chance. And they should read good books. I have a good book that I recommend to everybody. It's The Time That It Never Rained by Elmer Kelton. He's the best Western writer of all time. Voted by the Spur campaign and people should read that book. They should read the book that Marty Schubert recommended, Horse Trading by Ben Green and they should read the Prince of uh, the Secrets of Professionals Handicapping by Robert Bacon. Well, Absolutely. That's, that's, my, that's my recommendation. Sounds, sounds good, sounds good. Um, well, well, thank you very much. I enjoyed chatting with you and I learned a lot and it brought back many memories. And I don't consider myself one of the greatest traders I've made many mistakes, but I'm still learning. And I think one of the things that is unique about me is I've been trading the markets continuously for 60 years. And I still trade every day, every night. And um, somehow um, I'm still, um, still able to make a profit. I'm, I'm still able to pay my expenses for my six kids. Well, the, the, that's amazing to maintain uh, such a dedication and, and passion throughout 60 years. Uh, and 60 years. Yeah, you know, the, the only person who is comparable is Henry Clues, who wrote a book called 50 Years of Trading. And um, I've, I've been doing it for 60 years, every day, every minute. That, that, that's a dedication and focus. Well, um, it, it's been a great pleasure, extremely informative, so, uh, so much learning uh, is con was condensed in this conversation. Thank you very much for doing this. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Nikita.